Hi, it's me again. Uh, welcome to part two of the February 5th lecture on um, how to read a poem, look at it. <laughs> this is part two of that. Um, but actually, this is part two of part one of how to read a poem. Um, so this is still for Tuesday the 5th. Okay, so the first thing, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the first thing I want to do is to finish up with the third of my three pieces of advice about how to uh, regard the, the visual elements of poetry. Um, and this one is to respect the white space. Okay? Other poem, I'm sorry, often poems visually say as much with their silence as they do with the words that make them up. Poems can be punctuated to facilitate or to detract from their metrical pattern, for example. And the commas and periods and parentheses and so forth can create effects not limited to the rhythm. Percy Shelley's Ode to the West Wind, for example, should make you hyperventilate if you read it properly, since so much of it is what we call enjambed, E-N-J-A-M-B-E-D. This is the term for a poetic sentence that continues over two or more lines without end-stopped punctuation. All right? Enjambed. In some cases. Um, when you read the poem aloud, you continue as if there were no line break. But even though the convention says not to pause, uh, which, by the way, this is a modern convention rather than uh, one that would have been around 100 years ago. There's the inevitable time that it takes for your eyes to run to the beginning of the next line, and poets often play with that instant to manipulate and influence the meaning of a poem. For example, in Wallace Stevens' poem, Notes Toward a Supreme Fiction, which is an awesome poem that I wrote about in my dissertation, um, but which is probably too long for this introductory class, one section considers the very impressive powers of an unnamed president, uh, who was probably FDR. Okay, so here's a quote from that, uh, which again, please refer to the transcript if this is um, hard to, to see exactly what I'm doing. The president ordains the bee to be immortal. The president ordains. But does the body lift its heavy wing, take up, again, an inexhaustible being, rise over the loftiest antagonist to drone the green phrases of its juvenile? Question mark? Okay, I'm doing this with my hand uh, because what you want to do when you're quoting lines of poetry, um, if it's not a block quote in an essay that you're writing, you would simply, you know, uh, like quote the words, and then when you get to the end of a line, in order to preserve the fact that the poem has lineated it, has broken that, that sentence into multiple lines, you put a forward slash. Uh, I, yeah, I believe I'm doing this right, so in the video you'll see the forward slash rather than the back slash. Um, the one that's on the same key as your question mark is the one that you want. So um, forward slash, uh, as I'm reading it aloud, should also indicate exactly where the line went down. Anyway, the answer to the question of um, does the body lift its heavy wing, take up again its inexhaustible being, rise over the loftiest antagonist to drone the green phrases of its juvenile, is no, no, it doesn't. Since the bee exists with or without the president's com command, and indeed human beings have very little power over bees, and I would put it to you that that is a good thing. Um, let the president of the bees, you know, look after them, as I say. The enjambment of the lines reinforces this conclusion. First of all, the bee, the insect, already includes its own license to be, uh, the be, like to be or not to be, uh, the pun within its own name, right? But the enjambment of be and immortal, uh, for an instant, leaves us with a ludicrously unnecessary be to be, right? Uh, before introducing us to the president's impossible command. The next lines clearly question the president's powers, but the observant reader already got the message thanks to the enjambment. Okay? When enjambment disrupts or prolongs the syntax of a line, we call that hard enjambment. That would be a sentence where you don't really know what's coming next uh, because you've, like, you've broken it up between the subject and the verb of a sentence. Um, right? um, and that you know, gives you a, a prime um, opportunity for ambiguity. Right? Where is this going? Um, or for a moment, it calls into question whether or not, uh, you know, the, a, a pun is going to be... Or it actually creates the pun, in other words, um, by having you guessing about the semantics of the rest of the sentence. Um, when it breaks up, when enjambment breaks up a sentence into one or more generally coherent clauses, you know, let, let's say... Um, Yeah, I mean, you've got a relative clause that describes something, but the clause itself is intact, and there's nothing that the enjambment does except for putting, you know, like, main part of sentence and then clause describing some noun within the sentence and then going back to the other main part of the sentence. Then we call that soft enjambment, because all you've done is basically taken a sentence and put it into lines uh, without altering the meaning or, or having the, uh, the lineation of the poem uh, interact with that meaning 
in, in ways that would call, uh, call into question what the poet is trying to say. Hard and Jam It, though, is really playing around with the medium by which that, that content is being conveyed to you. Okay. Um, yeah, so anyway, the process of dividing content into different lines on a page in general is called lineation. Like, I'm putting things into lines is lineation. It always has consequences for a poem, especially if the poem is written in free verse, in which case that's the only thing that makes it a poem. You've taken a prose paragraph and, and then put it into lines. Um, I mean, you still have to deal with that if you're looking at what's called a prose poem like Eliot's Hysteria, which, you know, clearly wants to be read as poetry, uh, as language aware of itself. Um, but hasn't gone through the process of actually, you know, breaking e each of those ideas uh, into d into different sense units, which I'll go over in, in just a second. Um, but for the case of a free verse poem, you're actually even more responsible for finding out what the meter actually is doing with the, uh, the the sense of the lines, rather than less responsible. Free verse has been liberated from rules and constraints, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't have meter or that it doesn't have lines. It does. It clearly does. You have to pay attention to that and figure out what's going on. It just actually means that you have less of um, a ladder, you know, to, to go from, I don't know what to make of this, to, oh, yes, other people have done something similar, and I can use that as kind of a crutch to get me pretty quickly into the poem. No, it's, it's playing with everything at once, and you have to find the new patterns that it's establishing as it goes. Anyway, um, because of all of these visual and auditory effects, you want to try to reproduce as best you can the original structure of the poem in your own writing. Um, if it's a three or more line passage that you wish to cite, make it into a block quotation, as I've, as I've done above in the transcript. Uh, make sure that you faithfully reproduce all the punctuation and capitalize the first words of every line, if that's how it is in the poem. Um, but, you know, don't do a damage to a poem by, like, decapitalizing things that wouldn't normally have appeared. Um, if it's shorter than three lines and you're quoting it, work that quotation into your sentence and use a forward slash, again above the uh, quotation mark, to indicate where the poem splits the lines up. Um, because again, this is data, and even if you're quoting it, you know you want to you want to replicate that data faithfully so that your reader can understand the point that you're trying to make. There has to be a way of of conveying how you're reading it, and first of all, not doing damage to the text by misrepresenting it. That's the first thing that you can do to make sure that, that you know, you'll be read favorably. All right, here's my postscript about sense units. Um, this is added to what I've said before. It's related to all of it, but if, if this hasn't been clear so far, I want to make sure that I put a nice little bow around it. Poetry's ability to establish patterns on multiple levels, sounds, meters, rhyme schemes, mean means that formal and prosodic evidence, right, or the form is, is how it looks on the page, the prosody is the meter, right? So formal and prosodic evidence is best talked about in terms of its interaction with the content of the words that they condition. Okay? This is all evidence, but you don't want to just have, like, here's a column about, you know, the, the form of the poem, and here's a column about the content, and, like, ne they never come into contact with each other. In other words, it's good to note that two words rhyme. It's better to note that their rhyming creates a productive pairing. You should always consider rhyming words as a set to analyze, uh, for example, since your attention has been drawn to them, usually also by the ry rhythm of the lines if, if it's at the end, if it's, if it's end rhyme. Um, it's good to be aware that the poem is setting up metrical patterns within its lines. It's better to realize that those patterns are altering the way that you receive those lines. They are mediating that information, and so on, right? So there's, there's like a baseline of being able to demonstrate that you know what an I am is, but then you know, like the whole point of this is not to get you to memorize pointless stuff, but to be able to use it uh, to be precise when you're describing the effects of poetry. Okay, so I, I don't. This is not just the stuff that I, I tell you so I'm able to write multiple choice questions that are objective, right? Um, but to equip you, to give you like a little utility belt that you can whip out, like you know, because you're Batman reading a poem, um, to equip you to be able to make these compelling readings, um, so that other people that also know these terms will immediately understand what you're saying, and you'll be able to do it not only precisely, but sophisticatedly. You can jump to the point where you're talking about I am's rather than having to explain, oh, I think this goes unstressed, stressed. You can just declare it an I am, and if I also know what an I am is, then we're, we're there much more quickly. All right? Uh, but consider, too, that the fact that poems can change up the ways that they have been mediating their lines throughout the text, right, maybe once or twice, maybe many, many times, uh, means that they that they um, not only can change their message, but their messenger. And that the visual form of the poem contains dynamic rather than static information. Some poems are short, exist in one stanza, uh, which, by the way, is the Italian word for room, or, or stasis, 
um, have only one rhyme scheme and never deviate from their metrical pattern. But most poems mix it up, right? And we need to have a way of, of conveying that mixture. Uh, another thought. If you set up a pattern, you can also use that as a useful container to convey data. Right? And here, I'm, you, I mean, you're the poet. Um, if you are using a familiar or prefabricated pattern, you can draw on generic conventions to heighten your reader's ability to expect certain things from your patterns. Okay? If this is the, you, I mean, you can still establish patterns if you're, you're doing something in free verse and no one has ever seen this pattern before. You can still do that, right? But that's just for you. Um, you can also use prefabricated patterns and then draw upon your reader's understanding of what those patterns mean in order to get yourself, again, fairly quickly to where you want to go. Um, so, for example, I've talked previously within these lectures about the 18th century's vogue for the heroic couplet, uh, which is a long string of perfectly rhymed couplets written in iambic pentameter. Right, so there are ten, ten um, beats, oh, sorry, five beats, five stressed beats per line, ten beats per line. That's where the pentameter is. It's named after the foot rather than the number of syllables. So ten syllables, five of which are stressed, all of which are going unstressed, stressed, right? To be or not to be, that is the question. If it then had uh, a line right after that that was also 10 beats and rhymed with question. <laughs> anyway, um, or, or here's a good example from the essay on criticism that Pope wrote. Um, True wit is nature to example, I'm oh, wait, to advantage dressed, what oft was thought but never so well expressed. I'm sorry, I screwed that one up, but it's really quite a witty line if you do it correctly. Um, and then just imagine, you know, 6,000 of those strung together. Uh, in, in like a 50-page long poem, uh, that's the 18th century, um, which which was is, is an incredibly interesting century to study if you want to go on with the English major, or or just to you know read on your own time. He had some good things to say about criticism, and then there's a the sequel, which is the essay on man, which is about people. Anyway, um, Pope's epistle to Arbuthnot, which was shorter, and that's the reason why I chose it for you. It's also a great example of how poets can use the heroic couplet as a sense unit. A sense unit. S-E-N-S-E. -S -E, right? so I'm making sense within a unit. By which we mean that the reader begins to expect an entire thought to be constructed, executed, and finished within that unit. In this case, the couplet. So within two lines. There's a full stop after that second rhymed word. So if you do that over you know, 3,000 times, and every time you do it, there's like a complete sentence that's strung out over two lines in which you know, they rhyme together. So I know not to associate that thought, um, except in a sequence, with the one before it or the one after it. Right? It doesn't go over four or five lines or something like that. Sense unit. That's my expectation. So when we read a poem like Robert Browning's My Last Duchess, which I believe is for this week, uh, which is also written in heroic couplets, um, but which is enjammed over almost every line, so that the Duke's speech just overflows, right? It doesn't seem to, um, you know, follow the pattern that Alexander Pope and John Dryden and Jonathan Swift established, that you're going to just have discrete thoughts within each couplet. Well, uh, sometimes when I teach that poem, I have to remind students to pay attention to the rhyme scheme at all, since to them, sometimes it seems like it may as well not be rhymed. Um, it's speech that overflows its bounds, though, right? At least it, it deviates from the expectation that you're going to have perfectly contained, you know, neat thoughts within each couplet. Um, but there is a way of associating that with the way that the Duke knows no laws, right? I mean, it's, it's, it also attests to his hubris, this kind of thing that we did in the 18th century. Doesn't apply to me, including not killing my wife, right? So anyway, he's a sociopath anyway in terms of the content. Also, in terms of the form, although probably we don't care about that quite as much as murder, uh, you know, the, the form is, is, is also um, tied to what the, what the Duke has been talking about. So, anyway. Uh, more conventionally, I mentioned earlier that, this thing called, that there is this thing called the Petrarchan Sonnet uh, that usually has an octet of eight lines and then a sestet of six lines, which have different rhyme schemes. Okay? So, we don't pay attention to an octet and a sestet just because someone told you to do it, but because this rhyme scheme... Um, associates the ABBA, ABBA together much more closely than the CDC, CDC, because they have different rhyming words and they form a pattern. Um, this format has been used so often that it's reasonable to assume that the first eight lines convey a single thought or emotion, and that there is then a distinction to be made between them and then the single thought or emotion that's contained within the last six lines. Now, we, we, it's, it's happened so often that we've even come up for, uh, with a term for this turn, from the octet to the sestet, it's called a volta. It, it just means that you know you want to you want to regard them separately, and that it's possible to think about it so that you already know when you're going into a Petrarchan sonnet that the first eight lines are going to be contrasted, often usefully, 
with the, what happens in the last six lines, right? I love her so much, but she has spurned me yet again. That, right? So it's, I love her so much. And, you know, and, and you can expect that. And so when you see it happening, you get a, like, a little thrill about how, how well you read for Tarkin's sonnets. Um, so anyway, we never want to leave our analysis in two pieces, one about the content and one about the form. We always, always want to bring form and content into conversation with each other when we are reading these poems. So that is the end of this lecture. Please um, come back again on Thursday when we'll be talking about tone, which is often the hardest thing to assess about a, about a poem. Uh, and it, but it is, you know, the, the logical consequence of trying to get to know the voice behind that is speaking through a poem, um, both in terms of its content and its form. Um, and then also diction, uh, which is a way of, of regarding critically not just what is being said, but the words that have been chosen to convey what has been said. Right? And since those two, since, since um, diction and tone are inextricably linked, I've, I've chosen to put them together um, in How to Read a Poem, a poem Part 2. All right, so thank you very much, and stay tuned for more.